So nice to welcome you all to uh, this um, session, which is focused on uh, shockwaves, and it's a clinically based session. Uh, thanks to Shockwave for organising this, and to my co-chair Eval Christensen. Uh, we're going to go through uh, three cases, which are going to be presented by uh, the finalists in this uh, presentation, and we're going to get the opportunity to go through the mechanics of the cases and what we can learn from them. So it is an interactive case session. We, we do encourage audience participation, uh, so don't feel too shy. So the objectives, as you can see on the screen, to understand the clinical utility of intravascular lithotripsy uh, is definitely the hot topic in PCR this year. People are wanting to understand everything they can about this technology, where to use, how to use, how to assess, and where patients can best benefit from this innovative technology. And uh, as I've said already, there, we have a panel of expert judges, some of which have uh, turned up today. Thank you, Dr. Hill, or to give you your full name, Lord Hill, uh, fifth in line to the throne, twice removed, um, have actually judged these cases and, and deemed them worthy of review. So it's worth saying that um, you know, this is new technology, but it is r rapidly ex exploding. And you can see that a great number of cases have been done already, uh, over 3,000 cases with 600 operators already, 25 countries, and uh, they kind of burst in publications to define and help us further understand this technology. It's fair to say that there's still a fair bit more work to do, and the enthusiasm that you're bringing to the session today is the kind of enthusiasm we're going to leverage moving forward to position the technology to get the best outcomes for our patients. We have published already Disrupt uh, CAD 1, and CAD 2 is on the verge of publication, which showing uh, low complications and good initial performance. We know that this is in a, you know, for calcific coronary disease, a relatively low complication subset. Uh, and we think there's a lot to begin uh, with future development of this technology in the kind of cohorts that we see frequently in our aging population. And you can see there that this uh, research program is a fundamental component of understanding any new technology, uh, and it will be as we continue to move forward with it. So it's interesting to see these kind of cases, which are, um, we may see examples of this within the case forum today, that we're, we're seeing a, a lot of use of shockwave in left main stem disease, which of course is a very high jeopardy population in a population traditionally uh, left to the surgeons and interventionists stayed well clear, usually to an absence of ability to treat these cases rather than a, a willingness to, to undertake them. And particularly with bifurcation and multivessel disease, you might think that whereas previously we'd be concerned about um, not having wire access and rotor cases, that's no longer a concern. And that tortuous osteal disease is also uh, up for discussion. And I think a lot of this comes, where we're trying to put these pieces together and come away with sensible ways to treat these patients. This is uh, something which I've worked on with um, colleagues, including Margaret McIntaggart in Glasgow, in which we're trying to give people essentially what we describe as a mind map for treating calcium. And I think the first thing we can say about that without going into this in too much detail is that the coronary angiogram, unfortunately, is inadequate to understand the depth uh, of calcium in the majority of cases. And you'll see that there's a pretty big imaging focus in the assessment uh, state phase of this. And what we're saying is that if you look angiographically and you see a high calcific burden of disease and you can't cross with a balloon, then you're going to go to rotational atherectomy. If you can cross with a balloon and you can cross with imaging, then what you find with imaging is going to guide your further therapy. And there probably are additional nuances that uh, will come out as this technology develops. But what we're, we are seeing is that the more concentric and the greater the depth of the calcium, the more it's suitable for intravascular lithotripsy following a failure of conventional balloon treatment. I think we're still uh, yet to define uh, how best to treat eccentric and nodular calcium, but we are starting to define this uh, treatment subset a lot better. And then we get to this modification phase, and I think just like any technology, uh, you want to make sure that your modification is sufficient ahead of stenting, 
whilst there have been some isolated reports of intravascular lithotripsy successfully treating underexpanded stents in calcific tissue, if you get to that point, that's a failure of uh, assessment, treatment, and uh, a realization that further therapy is required. So the modification can include your standard treatment of, of the current era, uh, non-compliant balloons, scoring balloons, rotablation, or conclude uh, intravascular lithotripsy, and that's what we're going to focus on today. And the, one of the key learning points I would tell you is that after you've treated something, it makes sense intuitively at least that you should reassess it prior to stent occlusion. And what you're looking for, again, should become apparent in the course of this uh, session, but you're looking for evidence of calcium fractures and some suggestion that you've restored vessel compliance ahead of stenting. And then you're really wanting to end with 90% 90, 90 stent apposition or better if you can. So with just that little prelude, uh, we're going to go on to the cases. And due to the complexity of the nomenclature of the names, I'm going to ask Eval to introduce the first uh, the first competitor. Thank you very much. Before we go to the cases, I'll just make you through the, some of the methods we use in this IVL technique. So the, the expanding and collapsing vapor bubble creates a short burst of sonic pressure waves. And the sonic pressure waves cracks calcium with an effective pressure for around 50 atmospheres, and the localized field effect within the vessel to the fracture intima and medial calcium. The integrated balloon facilitates efficient energy transfer during IVL, after which it's used to dilate the lesion to maximize lumen gain. So this shows it's very easy to use. You should, um, you just push a button and it delivers the energy in eight cycles. You have 10 pulses and eight cycles. Then the, you have um, fatigue of the delivery, uh, the, the, uh, the energy. So you have to take another catheter if it's not enough to crack the calcium. This is how it looks like. What have we learned? We are using imaging guidance. We use the benefit of pre-IVL and post-IVL and post-stenting. In this case, you can see that the calcium is all around in the intima. More than uh, half of the circle is with calcium. The depth is more than 0.5 millimeter. And longitudinally, if it's more than 5 millimeters, it's a strong indicator of stent under expansion if you don't modify the calcium. As in this case, after IVL, you can see the cracks in the calcium going from the lumen into the vessel wall. And after you have done that, you can check the stent expansion. You can also check before you put in the stent that you have achieved the cracks in the calcium you want. So it's effective regardless of its concentric or eccentric calcium. In this case, we have a very deep layer of calcified intima and it's able to crack all the way through. It can also crack calcium that's present in the media. It can also crack thin calcium and thick calcium. So this is examples of eccentric calcium and concentric calcium. If you have eccentric calcium, there's a longer distance from the emitter to the calcium. It needs more energy to crack. You also have escape of the energy out through the normal tissue. So you need more energy if you want to crack the eccentric calcium compared to concentric calcium, where it's reflected back towards the lumen. So more pulses is needed in eccentric calcium, less pulses is needed in the concentric calcium. So if you cannot deliver the balloon, you may need to predilate with a non-compliant balloon. And you know you have 80 pulses, so you can try to maximize the catheter utility by looking into what length do you want to target with IVL, and then you can distribute the pulses around this and maximize the catheter utility. Sometimes you have capture, you should know that. It's benign and not very dangerous to the patient when having capture during this uh, procedure. And now we should have the first case presentation by Slavomir, the first nominee. Please remember that you should vote in the system for the top shock case that will be awarded afterwards. 
Yeah, we'll, we'll talk you through the voting after, after all the, the presentations. Thank you very much, uh, Chairmen, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure to present the case. Uh, complex PCI of severely calcified left coronary artery in patient disqualified from uh, coronary surgery. That is my disclosure. 62 years old male with stable coronary artery disease in third class according to uh, CCS. Uh, <coughs> NST elevation that you a few months ago uh, treated with PCI but uh, unsuccessfully. Hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, multilevel peripheral artery disease treated with end atherectomy of both iliac arteries, uh, lung tumor in the course of the diagnosis. ECHO revealed uh, moderate aortic stenosis and slightly diminished ejection fraction of left ventricle. In angio, we can see uh, severe distal left main disease uh, and proximal LAD and very tight. Uh, calcified lesion in ostium of the cerc and big marginal branch. We can see two, uh, two different views of left coronary artery and you can see uh, distal uh, severely calcified uh, left main, proximal LAD and uh, big marginal branch and, uh, and uh, circumflex. Uh, <clears throat> there were collaterals from right coronary artery to uh, distal circumflex. We performed two, du during diagnostic procedure, we performed two uh, IVUS runs from LAD to left main and from marginal branch to uh, left main to assess the calcium burden and stenosis severity. Uh, to choose optimal uh, procedure technique for, the, technique for this patient. I was revealed large calcification, uh, deep calcification in uh, left main LAD and uh, marginal branch. Uh, during a diagnostic uh, procedure, we found uh, large calcification in distal left main and proximal LAD and marginal branch. In such case, uh, calcified plaque modification is crucial for every bifurcation stent stenting technique. <coughs> in our opinion, anatomy was not suitable for rotational atherectomy due to deep calcification, large calcium burden, and artery, big arteries diameter. Uh, in distal left main, uh, the best option of treatment when we uh, are going to put two stent to stent technique is double kissing uh, crash. Uh, in majority of cases, treatment of choice. Intravascular uh, lithotripsy, in our opinion, was a good solution for this case. As usually, we used a radial approach, seven French guiding catheter, and as a first step of the procedure, we took the biggest shockwave balloon for all 12 millimeters, and we did uh, four applications in marginal branch as a first, and then uh, in left main and LAD. You can see we could introduce very easy um, shockwave balloon into tight lesion in marginal branch, and uh, we did four applications, then we removed uh, the balloon, shockwave balloon from marginal branch and uh, inserted into LAD and uh, left main and did uh, next four application of uh, sonic pressure waves. The picture after, uh, after uh, IVL application and uh, <coughs> you can see final outcome of complex PCI procedure with IVL. Uh, after IVL, <coughs> non-compliant balloon were used, and then we uh, implanted implement uh, DK crash technique. I would like to emphasize that all steps of the complex PCI procedure went easy. It means that IVL properly pre modified calcified plaque. To summarize this case, 
lithotripsy with shockwave balloon facilitated performing complex PCI in difficult bifurcation anatomy of severely calcified left main and marginal branch. Shockwave balloon was used as a primary approach without preceding plaque modification. Thank you very much. So we have some audience interaction. I know we've all, do you want to kick that off with a question? A any questions from the audience? I have a question for you. You said that you saw deep calcium and that was the reason for using the shockwave. Can you quantitate the, the depth of the calcium with this uh, ibis or can you, can you comment on that? Okay. Uh, uh, in my opinion, we, uh, uh, we saw calcium in diagnostic angiography uh, and we uh, didn't use OCT as a best method for assessment of deep calcification. But uh, uh, in our opinion, angio and, and IVUS revealed uh, large calcium burden, and we suppose that uh, deep calcification is present in this case, uh, <coughs> and uh, the arteries uh, had big diameter, and uh, of course we consider uh, rotational atherectomy because we are experienced in this technology at the training center for rotational atherectomy, <laughs> but uh, we decided to use IVL. Uh, it was our film case with shockwave uh, balloon. And uh, in this case uh, <coughs> went easy and with opt we achieved uh, optimal result of the PCI procedure. Yeah, it was a great case. Uh, yes, question from... Was IVIS imaging done post? Uh, <coughs> uh, diagnostic and therapeutic procedure uh, was performed not at the same time. And we use, uh, from different reasons, only do during the uh, diagnostic procedure. But we <coughs> have uh, data from IVUS and we, could, we can choose uh, optimal stents, diameters, lengths, uh, and so on. We didn't check stent opposition, but I, uh, I think that uh, uh, we achieved good stent opposition, good uh, minimal st stent area and so on. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, a good question, really, because you've demonstrated the first part of the algorithm that you assess, and I think the word of caution, I would say, is that you need to reassess prior to stent opposition, and you've got to, you have to reassess with imaging that you've got a good stent result as well. I mean, it, it looks angiographically good, but we know that, you know, um, Evald, you, you've designed October around this, that angiography and bifurcation disease is not, not adequate to tell you stent expansion. The, the, the only, I mean, I enjoyed the case as well and the, H, the HD images. The one thing I would say is that because there's distal filling of the second marginal doesn't justify just ignoring it, you know. I certainly would be wiring and stenting that as well. The angulation of that lesion does make that difficult. And I think what's interesting about the case is that it may well be there was a hazard associated with root ablation here. You know, you're a very experienced root center, but what was notable was that the cirque was very markedly angulated. And I don't know if you've got any comments on that. We wonder uh, which method should be used in such a calcified uh, artery. But uh, <coughs> uh, during diagnostic procedure, the uh, IVUS probe went easy to uh, very tight stenosed, uh, stenosis of uh, marginal branch. And we decided to do without rotablation uh, shockwave, use shockwave balloon. And uh, I think it was a good decision. In my opinion, we can join first rotational atherectomy, then a shockwave, it's a very good option. In this case, we use only a shockwave with a good final result. Yeah, and I think it's, it's interesting how your intuition in clinical practice will drive these kinds of algorithms. You know, like, we, can't, we can pass imaging, therefore the probability of needing upfront IVUS is that bit lower. But if we can't pass our imaging, then we, maybe we need Rota up front. Uh, yes, and they start to become a little bit more concrete and learning lessons that we can take away and apply on a more systematic basis to perhaps less experienced centers. Okay, uh, I definitely agree. Final, uh, I was a uh, good option for, the, for this case. <coughs>
but we uh, didn't perform. I think it's a good teaching point to say that if you know you want to use Ivers in the left mean, don't use it in just one step of the procedure. Use it up front and also during, before you do your kissing, to see that you have not done abluminal rewiring. Sometimes when you jail a wire in the circ, you bias your guiding catheter out and I think we have seen the risk of coming outside a stent in the left main is much higher than expected. We see that in the core lab analysis in this October trial that we were discussing. So I really recommend before, during and after. I, I completely agree with, with you, but uh, diagnostic procedure was three days uh, before therapeutic procedure. We have to consult uh, the patient in heart team and it was the reason we don't use uh, final uh, IVUS. But uh, I generally agree that it should be used, especially when we intervene uh, in left mine. Yeah. Great, Kate, with teaching points. Just one more point, actually, from the audience to take away. If, you know, without laboring it, uh, Eval's looking at an OCT study in the left main. And, you know, when he refers to abluminal wiring, of course, that in itself doesn't cause an issue, but if you try and balloon the stent uh, after abluminal wiring, you can make an absolute mess of the left main, and I think angiographically you can be falsely reassured that you've got a good result, and, and actually when, when Ewald and Niles shared the data about the instance of abluminal wiring with me, I was appalled at how high it was. So I think it, it is a, one of these red flag areas that as an interventional group, we have to be more meticulous for that kind of thing. Uh, okay, so thank you very much for thank that. Um, we're going <laughs> to have a slight deviation in, in, in order of the speakers. We're going to Ariana Gonzalez, you're, if you wouldn't mind speaking now. Uh, Ariana, that'd be great. Uh, she's going to talk to us on... Uh, Rototripsy, so a new word for us. Um, combination of rotational atherectomy and intravascular tripsy for the treatment of severely calcified lesions. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mariana Gonzalez. I'm from La Paz University Hospital. Um, well, uh, first of all, I apologize for my colleague, uh, uh, Alfonso Jurado, who couldn't come to present this case. Uh, he's just being father. Uh, the case is called rotatripsy, uh, a combination of rotational atherectomy and intravascular lithotripsy for the treatment of severely calcified lesions. I don't have any potential conflict of interest to declare. Um, well, I present to you a 76-year-old male patient with hypertension, type 2 diabetes mellitus, and dyslipidemia who was admitted for progressive angina. The echocardiogram saw preserved left ventricular ejection fraction with our regional wall motion anormalities, and the treadmill exercise test was positive for myocardial ischemia. For this reason, uh, the patient underwent a coronary angiography, which revealed a severe calcified uh, diffuse disease at proximal and a mild LAD. Uh, without any significant lesions in the other, in the other vessels. Uh, here you can check uh, the uh, coronary calcification without a contrast injection. And uh, we try to predilate with non-compliance balloons without full expansion of a three millimeters non-compliant balloon uh, appearing the, the typical image of dog bone, as you can see here in the, in the image. Uh, we confirm with IBUS the severity of calcification with 360 degree uh, calcium ring at several points. And uh, for at this point, uh, we decide to perform a rotational atherectomy with, with Rotapro system uh, using 1.2 and 1.5 bar. Uh, here you can uh, see how the device uh, crosses the, the lesion. However, uh, it was still undilatable with a three, uh, three millimeters non-compliant balloon uh, at high pressure at 24 atmosphere. So we thought it could be a good option to attempt uh, to, uh, to, to attempt for calcium debulking uh, intravascular lithotripsy. 
uh, we deliver a three by twelve millimeter soft wave, uh, and, and we need it to uh, to perform anchoring technique. So we inflating a one point five balloon in the in the diagonal branch. Uh, this style the here, this style the target lesion. Here is the soft wave balloon, and here the semi compliant balloon. And in this way, uh, we were able to cross the stenosis. So we could apply uh, 30 pulls at the undulatable lesion and, uh, and the uh, sorry and the other 50 pulses were applied uh, at the proximal mid LED with good balloon expansion uh, at six atmosphere after the pulses. Uh, this is the angiogram post rotablation and intravascular lithotripsy without any complications and a clear improvement of the of the of the lesions. And this is the OCT pullback with the angio uh, core register. Now I will uh, present in detail the, the different findings. And uh, with IBUS and OCT, uh, we demonst uh, demonstrate a circumferential uh, calcium plaques uh, with deep uh, with deep fractures. Uh, you can see uh, they are marked with arrow hair here and here and and here, and they are produced by the intravascular lithotripsy. And uh, we also saw uh, multiple intimal micro dissections produced by rotablation. Uh, note that uh, the lumen, um, note that the lumen is uh, expanding circumferentially with intravascular lithotripsy, whereas uh, with a rota a rotational atherectomy, a, a, a rota blade a, a just a near the guard wire, ablated only near the the guard wire. Uh, finally, we easily uh, deployed a uh, two overlap drag Latin stent, a verolumis, uh, verolumus, uh, Latin stent, 3 by 28 millimeters and 3.5 18 millimeters at mid segment and at the proximal segment uh, with an excellent uh, angiographic and OCT result, as you can see here, uh, with well, uh, well opposed uh, and well expansion the, the stent. So, uh, in conclusion, uh, rotational atherectomy allows the treatment of intimal calcium and permits to cross balloons and stents through severe lesions. However, it may not be enough to achieve uh, adequate expansion of this device uh, when circumferential deep calcium uh, plaques exist. Uh, intravascular lithotripsy uh, is a revolutionary tool to treat deep calcium and dilatable plaques. Uh, we believe that the combination of these two techniques, rotatripsy, may be useful in the percutaneous treatment of severely de novo calcified lesions. Thank you very much. So once again, we'll open up questions in the audience. Jonathan. With, with the crossing of the first blue. Yes. Uh, no, we we went uh, the uh, uh, rotational atherectomy because we have a more experience, a more experience uh, with that uh, at this moment. But I think this is uh, this insight uh, changed uh, because the good result with the with the intravascular lithotripsy. So yes, more for the for our experience in our in our center. So it's our first technique uh, when the the, the vulcan uh, calcium. Other comments? What was the size of the bird used? 1.5. 1.2 uh, uh, and then uh, 1.5 millimeters. So, I mean, just a take home message from the audience in Georgia case is actually th these kind of techniques to help device delivery in stiff non compliant vessels like uh, balloon anchoring is quite a ni nice te technique for people to use. and. It's also helpful for um, dilatation, side branch stenting, etc. to deliver balloons where you put a second balloon in a side branch and you use that almost as a coaxial anchor. And the, key, the key bit is that the closer that balloon is to the origin of the side branch, the more 
positive anchoring effect it will have as well. So that was a nice technique. And I guess Jonathan's question is an analogous to that, that how do you think this case has changed your decision making? And are there cases you would still do road ablation up front? Or are there cases you would go to IBL up front now? And how has that influenced things moving forward? Yes, uh, maybe I think uh, I think here in this case, uh, both of them, rotational atherectomy and the intravascular lithotripsy, uh, helps to to calcium the bulking. But I think in a different in a different ways. Other comments. I think it's also worth noticing that uh, in with the OCT, the effects aren't uh, exactly subtle. You can see the calcium in a way that actually isn't open to much doubt. Uh, you said this is your first case of IVL, uh, um, but I'm sure you still were able to recognize the, the calcific fractures, the yes, these deep, deep wall fractures. And of course, what that tells you is that the vessel compliance is now, you know, with confidence you can put the stents in. I think that yeah. part is what we were trying to emphasize previously with the algorithm, where once you've treated, you've assessed that it's now safe to put the stents in and get a good stent result. So that was a very nice demonstration of that. Another thing that needs to be shown is that when we have these cases, before we have IVL, we postulate very aggressively. And this is cases where we see the bad yes. perforations. Yes. And uh, when we have this nice compliant calcified tissue after IVL, it could be protecting against this, this hazard. Yes, this so, but we need to uh, generate more data about that. But uh, I think that's my impression that it's more uh, yes. tissue friendly. Yes, Calcium I think so. This is more friendly than a uh, rotational atherectomy. That was great. Many thanks. Okay, thank you. So there is now some diagnostic doubt as to whether Etienne Couture is in the room. So, all right. So we had uh, several standby speakers uh, in case you weren't here. So we're very grateful oh. you are here. So yes, I am. And we'll look forward to your presentation with a special um, anticipation then. And the title is Coronary Intravascular Lithotripsy for the Treatment of Heavily Calcified Osteolesions, an Emblematic Case. So, hi everyone. Um, on behalf of Dr. Lefebvre, who was the main operator on this case, I'm pleased to uh, uh, present you this case uh, today, tonight. Uh, this is a, uh, the case of an 85 years old woman, uh, mostly known for hypertension and dyslipidemia. Uh, she lives independently and has moderate frailty, and this is important in this presentation. Uh, she first came to us for a TAVI workup. Uh, she has indeed high gradient CVS with a normal LV function. Her um, risk score for surgical EVR was in the intermediate range with the SCS of about 4.2%. So um, when we saw her in the lab, she had quite normal uh, laboratory investigation except for a moderate chronic kidney disease. So here is it's her uh, baseline angiogram. So on the left part of the screen, you can appreciate the uh, severed and very tight stenosis of the right coronary artery. Uh, this is actually a right coronary dominant system. Uh, you can also see that in the PIV, there is competitive flow coming from the left system. On the left system, uh, this is near normal. I'm not showing every, um, every incidence, but the very tortuous vessel. And you can appreciate the, the calcification of the mitral and the aortic valve as well. Um, after hard team discussion, she was deemed a non-surgical case and uh, better for transfemoral TAVR, um, mostly due to her frailty and also her intermediate risk score. Um, decision was made to proceed first with the PCI uh, given the fact that the right coronary artery was dominant, but also that was a severely occluded le lesion that could uh, be a substrate for arrhythmia, but also ischemia during the TAVR, either from rapid pacing or uh, low flow. Uh, here is her MSCT. Um, at the time of her angiogram, we didn't have the MSCT, but uh, before the PCI, we had it. So you can appreciate in the tree plane uh, the very uh, um, extended calcification. Actually, this is a, a cal block of calcium, uh, not extending into the aorta, though. So here is our plan. So uh, we uh, decided to <coughs> include her in the DISRUPT-CAT2 uh, study. 
Um, because this was an osteo lesion, uh, we went for a GR for all guiding. Uh, rate riddle right access as we are a radial first center. Uh, we run through wire is our go-to wire. Hopefully the wire will, uh, will go and we won't have to use a dedicated uh, CTO wire. So the plan was to do a gentle predilatation and try to bring in the, um, the intravascular lito uh, trip C uh, balloon. So here's the case. Um, so it, the strategy was exactly as we uh, intended. So JR guide, uh, you can appreciate how poor the support was in this case. Um, the run through wire was in. And initially, a 1.5 millimeter Tazuna balloon was brought in the mouth of the ostium, not completely in. Uh, you can see that the ostium is actually beginning where the marker is, the central marker is. So mm -hmm. that was the first inflation. After, we were able to advance slightly uh, the balloon to the proximal part. Um, you can see that the balloon was kind of well expanded, but there is still printing on it, even though it is only a 1.5 millimeter balloon. So here's the control angiogram after the first balloon inflation with the Tazuna balloon. Um, we were planning to use probably a 2.5 millimeter shockwave balloon, uh, but after having seen that, and um, we saw that the distal uh, vascular bed was slightly uh, growing up, so we changed our mind and we decided to use a 3.0 millimeter balloon. So on the left part, you have the reference uh, picture after the Tazuna dilatation. Again, the uh, shockwave uh, balloon uh, went in, but not completely. But uh, we performed eight runs with the 3.0 millimeter balloon. And after each runs, we were able to uh, bring it a bit further, the balloon. And uh, this is the last angiogram at the last runs with the 3.0 millimeter balloon. On the left side, you have a still picture of uh, the control angiogram after the, the, the eight runs with the 3.0 millimeter balloon. Uh, you see that the artery had quite open, but there is still um, calcification constraint probably there. And as you know, osteo lesions are particular. They are either very calcified or sometimes they, they are very fibrotic tissue, both of them leading to poor stand expansion or a lot of recur. So we decided to, to crack the calcium as much as we could and use a 3-5 millimeter balloon. So again, inflate at four atmosphere, deli uh, deliver the acoustic um, pressure. And we actually did, uh, sorry, five runs with it, and we were quite happy. So on the right part of the screen, uh, you see at four atmosphere, after five implantation, the, the three five millimeter balloon was quite well expanded. So then we, were, uh, we went for the uh, stent implantation. Uh, we like to use the um, LAO uh, 13, it's not the LAO 30, it's more the LAO 90 degrees, the profile view, to make sure that we are covering the ost. So we see that the proximal marker is well positioned um, relative to the ostium. The stent expansion um, is probably it's well expanded. And after the stenting, you can appreciate that there is maybe a mild uh, recall stent under expansion on the proximal part of the, the lesion. But again, this is a pretty good result so far. Um, we did a stent vis. We, bring, we brought a 4 <coughs> NC balloon that we inflate to a 16 atmosphere. And here is the final result. You have the steel frame on the left side. And this is the final angio. So, Again, on the right part of the screen, you can appreciate that the support was very poor. Uh, we decided to go right radial, but probably femoral could lead to the, the same, uh, a very poor support as well. So uh, following the PCI, uh, the patient underwent TAVR two weeks after. She had an uneventful uh, procedure with a nice clinical evolution. Uh, oh, yeah, and the valve is uh, pretty nice too. So, as a case, case takeaway, I think that here the problem was support, and surprisingly, after the balloon went in, the Tazuna balloon, the uh, shock wave went pretty easily. Um, so, as a take home message, I think we should not rule out this option when we are approaching lesion that we anticipate that, pro that support will be a problem. So, first, don't rule out this option. Second, think about it, about plaque modification in general, but also about shock wave in treating osteo lesion. We know that there is more recoil, more stent uh, under expansion, and I know you guys probably treat a lot of instant restenosis in osteo lesion too. So plaque modification has to be used with a very low threshold. And in this particular case, we can say that the patient was quite high risk due to her severe AS, even though her LV function was normal, but we can say that uh, 
this tool really uh, transform a complex case into a relatively straightforward procedure. So for at least this patient, that was a game changer. So thank you. Great case. Any questions or comments from the audience? You didn't need uh, imaging in this case. Can you comment? Yeah, on I was that? expecting this question. Uh, actually, you saw the MSCT. We didn't repeat the MSCT to see uh, if we crack the calcium, obviously, but uh, uh, we were quite confident of the. She, she is an 85 years old woman. She was of a very small height. Um, we expected to maybe have a stent 3 or 3 5. As we were inflating the balloon, the distal vascular bed was still growing up, growing up. And at some point, a 3 5 neighbor the balloon, post dilated with a 4 0. Um, uh, we were pretty confident that we uh, had good stent opposition. Yeah, I think, uh, again, we don't want to labor the imaging point, or, or maybe we do, but. Um, the, the rationale for imaging there is number one, stent sizing. Number two, has the lithotripsy works using a surrogate marker of that, a balloon, and accept that that's a reasonable thing to do on occasion. I think the question it doesn't really answer is, is your stent under expansion due to recoil, or is it due to that you haven't cracked the calcium in the first place? I mean, yes, as you say yourself, these osteo lesions have a high degree of collagenous tissue as well as calcium, and Sometimes they need two stents at the osteum, but of course you wouldn't want to do that if you hadn't modified the calcium. <laughs> so I would say it would still make the hypothesis that imaging is going to add a lot of value in that case, irrespective of her age and general frailty. You still want to get it right, don't you? So, Question from the audience there. I saw a hand going up somewhere. No? Yes, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so that's a good question. The question for those of you who didn't hear it was, can you use shockwave to treat underexpanded tens, stents where the mechanism of underexpansion is uh, resistant calcific tissue? I mean, the short answer is there's not a lot of data out there at the moment. There are a couple of case series that we, we published one uh, towards the end of last year in which it was markedly effective. We, there's been quite a lot of anecdotal reports. Um, one of the live cases at one of the British meetings last year was an underexpanded stent, which had been, you know, already treated with an OPM balloon un unsuccessfully. And we've got a case series that's in in South London of about 20 underexpanded stents, all of which have um, been successfully treated. So the underlying messaging is do it right the first time. But if your colleague, because of course you would never put a stent into a calcific tissue without treating it first. But if your colleague who's less careful than you has done that, then yes, it does appear to be effective, with the caveat is that we, the, the actual medium term effects of the lithotripsy on the stent are, are still unknown or are poorly described in a way. Uh, yeah, another question? The, the reason that you inflate the balloon is to get the, um, the fluid um, to uh, work against the vessel wall. And you have so much calcium, it will not make that much of a difference. And the balloon is not built for that pressure. Because when you have a higher rated burst pressure in the balloon, there's a price to pay for crossability. So there's no need for that. You just check if you have done something with the six atmosphere after you have gone four atmosphere, just to check if the cracks has being uh, given a modification that it will open the balloon. So at the moment, that you should not go above these uh, recommended pressures. It they should be able to generate bubbles in the um, sail, uh, saline in the, the balloon combined with the contrast to generate the oscillations that should be transmitted to the calcium. Any other questions related to this specific case? Yes, back at the room there. It's based on the Sprat mechanics, you know, in my head. 
So, so at the moment, it's a, it's a it's a forum for discussion. I'm not saying it's an absolute absolute you must do it, and I know where you live, and I'll follow you home. And if you don't, but um, it's a guideline, and it's up for discussion. I think we're at a point in this therapy where it's the dissemination is increasing all the time, and as as a consequence, forums like this are a very valuable source of sharing information. And I think we want to put that into as formalize the strategy at present. So the algorithm isn't entirely evidence-based. It's just a suggestion for therapy that we'll work on to try and make it as robust as possible. There is this uh, publication in your intervention where they just observed um, the calcium. And this is a kind of rule of five, meaning that if the depth is more than 0 0.5 into the vessel wall, you can see that with OCT and not with IVUS. And when the angulation is more than 50%, 180 degrees, and when the length in the longitudinal play is more than five millimeters, then you have the highest score and the highest risk of ending up with an underexpanded stent. So this is just a, a scoring system indicating that you should do something more than just ballooning. There is other situations where, where you can use this imaging. In the, the disease is often in the bifurcation. And the carina, the flow divider, is often disease-free. That means that the calcium sits opposite to the side branch. If you predilate in this region, we see that in October trial, only ballooning will make the balloon bulge into the side branch. And you don't modify this chunk of calcium opposite to the side branch. And imaging can help you. And imaging can also help you if you, know you, if you only want to go with rotor. The rotor birth follows the wire. So if the wire sits or the imaging catheter sits opposite to the eccentric calcium. The rotor burr will never touch that. So this is another indication for the imaging guidance. You should see where sits the calcium in bifurcation. How deep is it? How long is it? How much it does it uh, go around the vessel? So imaging before you put in the stand. To yeah. see. We should have t-shirts, shouldn't we? So imaging. <laughs> so save us talking about it all the time. So, so great. We, uh, yeah. Um, any f further to this case, it was really a great case, and I think it shows that we now can treat patient that was really difficult to treat before we have this new technology. Any further comments, or should we go further to the yeah. voting? Let's do that. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. So I'm just going to summarize uh, the cases we've seen. We saw three great cases. Um, the first case, uh, left main case, treatment of CERC and LED uh, with shockwave therapy. Uh, then we've just, out of, slightly out of order, but we heard from Massey in France that osteo lesion, and we discussed. And, and then we had the lesion from Madrid, again with incorrect photo. Uh, of rhodotripsy, uh, rhodoblation, and then followed by lithotripsy. So we're going to go to um, the, the voting. Uh, so if you've got your app open, uh, you can go to the Topshock Symposium if you want to do that now. Uh, and then you could get once I'll go on to the next screen before before you vote. I just want to give you a bit of time. I know you're all technology very savvy and it'll only take you a second or two. So the other two cases come up as well because you, there's a prize for you too. And we'd like to thank the audience uh, for contributing to a great session and uh, enjoy the rest of PCR. <laughs>